So if you've been with us for the past couple of weeks, you'll know that we've been in the whole story since January. So we've, we're, we're kind of wrapping up. This is the last sermon of the whole story for a little while. Aw, there it is. Um, so it's the last, this is the last sermon in the whole story f- for a short while, and, and we've kind of taken a break from uh, the, the whole story uh, because we were going to be going through about First and Second Chronicles, which is just repeat information of Samuel and Kings, and so we decided to do a character study on someone named Nehemiah, uh, found in the book of Nehemiah in the Old Testament. And just to give you a little background on Nehemiah, he was just an ordinary guy. He wasn't uh, you know, a prophet, he wasn't a priest, he wasn't a king, an architect, a builder. Uh, you know, he wasn't any of that, but what he was, was a servant, an ordinary guy. Uh, he served as the cupbearer for uh, King Artaxerxes of Persia. And so uh, in that job, he, he, did, he did things like a butler would or an advisor. Uh, but to explain the cupbearer, um, Pastor Jeff used a really good analogy a couple of weeks ago. Essentially, what the cupbearer does is he bears the cup. <laughs> Pity laughs. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. But he bears the cup, and he, he drinks from the cup to make sure it isn't poisoned, and, and the king would be okay if he drank from it. Um, so as he was serving in this role as the cupbearer, uh, he uh, heard news from his brother that Jerusalem was destroyed. And if you remember, in about 587 B.C., the evil king Nebuchadnezzar uh, ransacked Jerusalem, destroying the temple, destroying the walls, burning everything down, and strategically separated the people uh, to, to break their morale and, and sort of acclimate them to Babylonian culture. Uh, So uh, they have all been dispersed throughout the nations, um, and Nehemiah hears news of what's going on in Jerusalem, that that the walls are destroyed, the temple's destroyed, his people are are crying out, and and what does it do? Do you guys remember from week one uh, what he did? He uh, sat down to cry, he knelt down to pray, and then he stood up to act. Excuse me. So Nehemiah uh, had his heart broken uh, by the the plight of his by the cry of his people, and so he sat down and he prayed to God that that he would be able to do something. And through that, the Lord supplied him energy and supplied him strength to go to the king, who uh, I might add, you're not supposed to be sad in front of, otherwise he'll cut cut your sad head off, uh, and, and he appeared sad before the king, and the king was like, what do you want? What do you need? And he's like, I want to go to Jerusalem and help him out. And he's like, okay, let's, let's get, her, get her moving, um, as we would say today. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, so Nehemiah is, is now uh, doing this good work. He, he's beginning, he's, he's going to Jerusalem, and, and, we, and we know that uh, it was kind of slow progress at the start. Like, things were happening, uh, but but as the progress started to improve, as things started to increase, what happened? There was some opposition. And, and what do we know about opposition? As soon as the work starts to go down, as soon as the good work starts to happen, the opposition shows up. As soon as we begin a good work, as soon as we start uh, changing our lives for Jesus, as soon as we start following in that calling, uh, the opposition uh, begins to show up. We heard last week that uh, you know, if, if you're not facing any opposition in your walk with Jesus, you, you, might not, you might not be doing the good work that he's called you to. You might not be doing that good work. But you know, as soon as your life starts to get together, the opposition shows up. The enemy shows up. And what's his main goal? To steal, to kill, and to destroy. But if he can't destroy you, he's going to do something else. He's going to distract you. Last month, a lot of our leaders, 17 of us, in fact, went to Florida, Orlando. I know, crazy, right? Like we were all in Orlando for this conference. We had to travel all the way there. It was just the worst. I'm playing. We went to Orlando. It was pretty cool. Um, the conference was amazing, and there we heard from a speaker. And the speaker uh, gave an analogy. Uh, she told a story of when she was younger, when her dad took her to the beach, and how he would set up uh, umbrellas in the sand to, to act as, as waypoints um, in the ocean so they don't start drifting. If you've ever been to the ocean, you know that uh, you can drift uh, a lot in there, and you can be sucked out to sea, uh, you know, through the whatever it's called. I don't know. I'm, I'm a biologist. I'm not a marine dude. Uh, 
Um, but anyway, they can be sucked out to sea. And so uh, what, those, what those points did was kind of show them where they should be. Um, and, and, and she gave sort of the conclusion to this talk was, was this. All you have to do to drift is nothing. And that's what the enemy tries to do in distracting you. He wants to take your attention away from the two points God has put in your life, that your father has put in your life, in this ocean uh, that, that we live in, and he's saying, okay, here are your points. Make sure you hold on to those and you know where they're at, so you know where you're supposed to be. What the enemy does is distract you, distracts you. He takes your attention off of those umbrellas, those points, and pretty soon you're drifting and drifting and drifting and drifting, and you have to work to get back to where you were at. So, Nehemiah, in this story, the enemy does the exact same thing. He tries to distract him. So today's message is entitled Denying Distractions. And we're going to be looking at a couple of examples on how Nehemiah denied those distractions that, he was, uh, that, were, that were placed in front of him. And so we're going to be going through uh, essentially the, the entirety of Nehemiah chapter 6. So I don't want to read the whole thing with you, but if you would please rise for the reading of the first two verses with me. Now when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arab and the rest of the enemies heard that I had built the wall and that there was no breach left in it, although at, up to that time I had not set up the doors in the gates, Sanballat and Geshem came to me saying, Come, let us meet together at Hekephorim in the plain of Ono, but they intended to do me harm. You may be seated. So uh, what's, what's going on here? Uh, first off, I want to say that this is an incredible accomplishment because, because Nehemiah was a what? He was an ordinary guy. He was a servant to the king. He wasn't a builder. He wasn't an architect. He wasn't an engineer. He didn't have uh, you know, months and months of experience making different church building plans in his office on uh, uh, freefloorplanmaker.net. So like this guy uh, just didn't have any experience in this stuff, but, but yet... Uh, it says in verse, uh, in verse 1 uh, that I had built the wall and there was no breach left in it except for the gates which needed the doors. And so th this whole wall surrounding the entire city of Jerusalem had been built up by someone with no building experience. And he inspired people like perfumers, like what do they do? They make perfume. They don't build walls. Uh, you know, people who, who wouldn't necessarily build, he inspired them to, to help reconstruct this wall. But this, this man was inspired by God. But what do we know? We know as soon as the work begins to go down, the opposition shows up. The enemies of Nehemiah wanted him to stop building the wall so they, uh, so they could harm him. In that last part it said, but they meant to do me harm. Roger uh, Albin came up to me after last service and he was like, I, I think how he discerned uh, how the enemy, or if the enemy was going to harm him was because they met in the plane of, oh no. And he said, oh no, that's not going to happen. Okay, tough crowd. Tough crowd. <laughs> so, thanks for the pity laughs. I appreciate that. Uh, but in all seriousness, uh, though it seems like this story of, of this Old Testament dude named Nehemiah doesn't really have any meaning in our own life, it really does. Right? Although we're not going to be building walls or rebuilding a temple or, or you know, putting gates and doors and gates and building a sheep gate and the flood gate and the horse gate and the dung gate, like all those gates, the water gate, no, I'm playing. That was a, that was a joke. <laughs> uh, but although we're probably not going to be doing that, God has, has specifically made for us a calling in life. Paul writes to the church of Ephesus in Ephesians 2.10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for what? For good works, that he has prepared for us beforehand that we should walk in them. And so God, before the creation of the universe, he thought of you, right? We know that he thought of us. When I was in my mother's womb, he thought of me. He, he knit me together. But, but even before that, before he even created anything, he thought of you and he said, man, man, Luke is going to have this. This is going to be what I have for him. Kyle is going to do this. Larry's going to do this. Sam is going to do this. Tim is going to do this good work. Before 
the creation of the universe. He had you in mind, and he had the good work for you established. So if you're here today and you're thinking, man, this story couldn't possibly relate to me. This story couldn't possibly be anything about me because I'm not a builder, right? I'm, I'm, I'm not a perfume maker, right? You're just an ordinary person. But that's what Nehemiah was. He was an ordinary person with a call from God on his heart. Sometimes, let's go back. I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. So, so listen, God has called you to this good work. And, and let's say, for example, you begin doing this, this work for the kingdom. Like you're finally like, man, I'm ready to surrender. I'm ready to step into this calling. Whatever it is, God, I'm ready. Right? And you begin doing this good work, and, and you have people who are criticizing your work. You have, you have haters on social media commenting on all your stuff, all your progress, and, and, and you're just continuing to do this work, and, and you have this cool following maybe, but, but there's also people who, who just hate you. Uh, let's, let's imagine for a moment that one of those people, uh, one of your critics says, hey, I, w- I want to talk. I want to talk about what you're doing. Like, like let's, let's debate what's going on. Uh, you, you could possibly think, this, this is what I, like some, someone like myself might think, is like, man, this, this is a great opportunity to convert my critics or further my influence or establish my brand with, with people who disagree with me. Right? It, it might be the perfect opportunity to do that. But oftentimes, what we think is an opportunity, God calls a distraction. Oftentimes, what we think might be an opportunity to establish ourselves, to convert our critics, God calls a distraction. And Nehemiah recognized that. Nehemiah recognized that. Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem wanted to distract Nehemiah from his good work. Why? Because they were afraid. They wanted to distract. And, and, and I'm saying distract a lot. They wanted to distract. I'm saying this a whole bunch. It's repetitive for a reason. I want us to get to know this. I want us to get familiar with, with, the, with uh, the, the weapon that the enemy uses in distraction. Right? Uh, today's era, right? The, 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 the climate, the, the society that we live in today is, I could argue, is the easiest of all generations to become distracted. Why? Because we have things in our pockets that ding every five minutes that go off and distract us from the work that God has called us to do. Maybe, uh, you know, maybe you're just sitting at work, you know, doing your job. You know, maybe the Lord has just called you to do that job, and then your phone dings, and, it, and maybe it's a game that you've been grinding on. You're, like, trying to level up. Maybe it's, like, Clash of Clans or, or whatever. Or maybe it's, like, a text from someone you've been talking to or, or your wife or what, whatever it is. Or, uh, or perhaps it's in church and the ESPN ringtone goes off. Um, that happened a couple of times, but that's okay, right? Uh, but, but we have never been more passionate about being distracted ever in our lives. Would you agree with that? We have never been so passionate about doing nothing in our lives, and it's distracting us from the call of God. So what do we know? We know that if the enemy can't destroy us, he will distract us. Right? Uh, we were talking in my gospel community on Wednesday about uh, spiritual warfare, um, and uh, t- two individuals in there, uh, they, they, uh, one, uh, she used to live in Uganda, and she, she told us about the different sort of voodoo that they practice there, like witch doctors and all this stuff that, that's like actual demonic oppression and possession and, and like magic stuff that, that's so weird that we don't see, uh, and, and we don't see that in America. And I think there's a reason for that. Number one, we don't, we don't believe that voodoo has any power here. So why would the enemy work so hard to try and do that when he already has us in his grasp with cell phones and social media? The enemy already has us there. He's all, like, this, this is the warfare that we're talking about. Right? Like, like, for example, I, w- I was sitting down to write this sermon, uh, and, and my phone just kept, just kept buzzing. And in fact, it was a game that I've been grinding uh, on, on my phone. It's like a racing game. I won't talk about that. But it, but it just like it was like notifications, and, and I was like, bro, like simmer down. Like I'm not trying to do that. Like social media was blowing up. My text messages were blowing up, and and so 
like these distractions are real and they present themselves in different ways. So how does Nehemiah combat these distractions? What does he do in order to, to fight against the enemy in that way? I mean, he, do, he doesn't call down angels. He doesn't do any of that. He, he does something simple. He has learned the art of saying no. He simply says no. Hey, uh, c- can, we, uh, can we meet so we can talk about No. Uh, Nehemiah, could you, could you just take a break from, from building that? No. Hey, uh, Nehemiah, I, no, no, no. Nehemiah has learned the art of saying no. Uh, the, the second point that I want to talk about is one of the biggest ministry tools that we have is saying no. Right? Uh, you probably have noticed that, that Pastor Jeff is fairly unreachable throughout the week. Um, and this is strategic. He makes himself strategically available and strategically unavailable for a couple of reasons. Like I had mentioned, this brother just crushes it every week. He casts vision. He writes sermons for, he puts in about 20 hours or more uh, work into writing sermons. He goes home and he takes care of his family with with a third child on the way. Uh, and, And he's doing all of this. So he has to be very strategic with his time, with who he meets with, with the things that he does. Uh, because he, here, here's the reality. Well, Pastor was talking about the building project that we want to do. Um, in, in order to, it, saying no to the other things, the, uh, the inaction is actually saying yes to stop growing. And so in that same sense, in order to meet with people or to, uh, to do things, he has to say no to something else to say yes to that thing. And, and, and we, we don't say this because we don't want to hang out or, or we don't want to counsel you. We say it because we care about you and we want you to know the reason why that we're mostly unavailable. Right? Like, here, here's an example. Uh, you wouldn't go to a surgeon in the middle of heart surgery and ask that heart surgeon to stop doing surgery to, to uh, consult, to have a consult, consult or, or to begin surgery on you. No, you'd have to wait until that work is done before the surgeon could come help you. And that's, that's kind of how it is, right? So, so what we need to do as, as people in ministry is learn the art of saying no. And it's really, really, really simple. I can teach you. Would you like to, would you like to know how to say no? 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 Oh, she, she's got it, man. Here you go, no. Uh, so so here's, here's what you have to do. Here's what you have to do. You just need to stand up straight or sit up straight. Right? Let's all do this together. So like, sit up straight, okay? nice and straight, nice and tall. Sit up strong. Uh, maybe tilt your head down just a little bit. You're going to look, look him straight in the eyes, and you're going to say, no. Did you get that? <laughs> no. Like, like say, say it with me. Just like, okay, ready? One, two, three. No. Okay, cool. Again, no. No. Okay, awesome. So how, uh, if someone asks you to come into work, those of you who have uh, kind of mixed up schedules, right? So those of you who have been asked to come into work and you can never say no, here's how I want you to practice. If, if they're calling you up or they're texting you, you say no, and then you hang up. And like, like seriously, <laughs> here's the thing. You don't have to give an explanation as to why you're not showing up to, to cover someone's or You can just say no. Right? The same thing applies to ministry. You don't really have to give, uh, to give an explanation, although it's, it's probably polite. Uh, you don't have to give an explanation as to why you're saying no. But, but here's what I want to clear up. What I'm not saying, I want you to listen very clearly, what I'm not saying is that if God has called you to something, you don't get to say no to everything that is, is outside of, of that. So if God's called you to kids' ministry and, and you're asked to help out on the tech team uh, when, when you're off, you, you don't just get to say, no, that's, that's not my job or that's too hard for me. Uh, I'm not going to do that. That, that. That's not what we're saying, right? Because Christ calls us to live and serve sacrificially. He doesn't call us to comfort Christianity. And so we don't say no to the hard things. We say no to the things that distract us from the calling that God has put in our lives, right? Amen? Amen. Amen. That's, that, that, that's what I'm talking about. We must be strategic about our no's. Distractions. <laughs> Distractions. That was planned, by the way. I, was just, I just want to clear that up. And it was, it was Royce who's filming <laughs> off in the sermon. So, I love that guy. Uh, man. 
So we, we have to say no, and we don't say no because we don't care. We do it because we do care about the calling that God has placed in our life, that he's established for us before the creation of the earth. Four different times, Nehemiah says no. Four different times, the enemy asks uh, Nehemiah to meet. Four different times. And on the fifth time, something, something is interesting happens. Uh, scripture, scripture says this. In the same way, Sanblat for the fifth time sent his servant to me with an open letter in his hand, and in it was written, It is reported among the nations, and Geshem also says it, that you and the Jews intend to rebel. <gasps> There's a rumor that you and the Jews intend to rebel. That is why you are building up the wall. And according to these reports, you wish to become their king. Oh, another gasp there. Uh, you wish to become their king. And you have also set up prophets to proclaim concerning you in Jerusalem, there is a king in Judah. And now the king will hear these reports. So now come and let us take counsel together. So these brothers are fabricating a story. They're making up a rumor. And Nehemiah responds like, nah, nah. You're making all this up. Like, like he literally just, no. You, you, have, you have fabricated all of this. All of this is an invention of your own mind. There's a rumor. Hey, Nehemiah, I got some tea to spill, as us cool kids say these days. There's a king. You want to rebel. There's this rumor going around, and Geshem says it's true, that, that you intend to do this. There's a rumor. Can I, can I just say something a little hard about rumors? So just kind of beat you up a little bit. Is that okay? Yeah. Don't practice the art of saying no right now. <laughs> Here, here's, here's the thing. Rumors are held and kept by haters. They are spread by fools and they are believed by idiots. Rumors are held by haters, spread by fools, and kept by idiots. In other words, rumors are spread by those who hate. Or excuse me, they are kept by those who hate. They are spread by those without wisdom, and they are believed by those without knowledge. This is sort of a tough thing to talk about. A lot of us could be offended by that, but, but if you are, um, this, is, this is also pretty difficult, and so I mean this with love, but if you're offended by that statement you probably fit into one of those categories. That's kind of rough, and hope any feelings weren't hurt. But rumors destroy. They are falsehoods. There's a rumor. I don't know, I don't know who I'm speaking to today. right? I don't, I don't know if there's a rumor going around about you, but, but don't let the whispers of people distract you from the call that God has in your life. Um, don't, don't let it pull you away be, because here's the thing. Here's the thing. You will never do the big things, the things God has called you to do, if you're distracted by small-minded people. You will never do that. Ha, ha, has anyone ever had a rumor spread around about them, maybe at school or, or at a job? Right? Uh, those things kind of hurt. Those things do hurt, those, those lies. I want to be really honest with you um, from, from my own history in life. I've never had a rumor spread about me that wasn't true, mainly because I was a bad kid. So um, I, I don't really know what it's like for people to just tell lies about me uh, to others. Um, so uh, just going to let that, that sit there with you. Um, but, but most of those things were true. But for those of you who had a rumor that was going around about them that was false, uh, here's, here's the third point. Don't worry about what others say about you. Worry about what's true about you. Don't worry about what the haters say, what the critics say. Worry about what's true. Because th this is exactly what Nehemiah did, right? He, he heard this rumor that, oh, you, Nehemiah, you want to rebel. You want to be the king in Judah. And he's just like, that's not true. God called me to do this, and the king told me I could. Uh, so there's that. He didn't believe the lie. He didn't believe the rumor. He didn't worry about what uh, was, was being said about him. He didn't go to his friends and say, hey, these, these, these guys, are, they're, they're making up falsehoods. Like, let's go post about him on Instagram or, or start a war with them. Put him in a group chat and start uh, calling him mean names. No, he, he didn't do that. 
mainly because they didn't have smartphones. Uh, but, <laughs> but what did he do? He, he simply did this. He simply did this in verse 9. So I continued the work with even greater determination. Man, we often let these lies of the enemy beat us up and trap us. But, but, but really what Nehemiah did was he took that, he's like, that's cool, I'm going to do this a, a lot more now. Like, you just, you just upset me, I'm just going to finish this with more determination. He's like, man, I really want to get these gates up because these guys are spreading falsehoods about me. So now I'm going to prove them wrong. I'm going to do this, more determined, more determined. What do we know? That when the work starts to go down, the opposition always shows up. When the work starts to good, go down, the opposition shows up. And what's really awesome about this is that Nehemiah, uh, he, he didn't go and, and do those things that we talked about, but, but he inspired people. He inspired uh, the, the men that were working underneath him to continue building the wall, right? They, they didn't stop building it, and you know, they, they could have been scared, but, but Nehemiah encouraged them. And so when they began building, they had what? They had a, a tool in one hand, and they had a weapon in the other. Like They were like, man, I'm going to go build this wall, but if any one of those little mugs like, show up in here, I'm going to sick Royce on it. No. Um, like... It, it's kind of cocky if, if you think about it, right? They're just like, they're going to build, but if anyone else shows up, they're going to cut them down. You know what that kind of sounds like? Maybe not totally, but, but the Word of God. Right? The, the Word of God, Hebrews 4, 12 says that, is, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It is a tool to use for, for teaching, for correcting, for uh, you know, that, and then it's also a weapon to be used to, to divide the lies from the truth. And so Nehemiah used the word of God, although it wasn't written down, but it was a call on his heart. He used that word from the Lord to, to divide the lies from the truth, to divide the distraction from the purpose, the distraction from the calling. You've got a tool in one hand and a weapon in the other. And you're prepared to do the work of God. And when the opposition tries to talk us out or discourage us, we're not going to listen to them. Because we know the calling God has placed in our life. And we will work with even more determination. So what do we know? Once the walls start going up, once the work starts going down, the opposition always shows up. And, and, and here's the thing. God is going to bless that. Right? If you step into your calling, God is going to bless that in your life. As soon as you start doing that, the Lord is going to say, Hey, listen, you're doing this work. He's going to supply you with energy. He's going to supply you with the resources, with the strength to do it. The opposition is still going to show up. But, but he has established this for you. Uh, Ephesians 2.10, remember again that you are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. You will step into this, and he will begin to bless that ministry. And one day, God's going to start showing you the fruit of your labor. One day, you could be making a difference and restore kids. One day, you could be making a huge impact on the tech team or on the worship team. One day, you could be uh, leading the youth group and changing young men and women's lives forever. You could uh, make a difference in a church that you plant in a small town. One day the Lord could inspire you, call you to do this, and, and you could start seeing the fruit of your labor in these places. But when that happens, when you start to see your success, when you start to see all that God is doing, it gets a little scary around this point. And here's why. As prideful human beings, we begin to think that the success is because of me. The success is, lies here. The reason why things are going so well is because I am so good. And that's a problem. Because it all came from God. The calling came from God. The supply of energy, the supply of strength, the resources came from God. And as soon as we start putting it here, that's when things start going rough. We start to lead with an entitled spirit. I am entitled to this because I did this. I am entitled to that because of this. And we see that 
so often in a lot of false churches and a lot of cults. The leaders of those, of those places, they start off usually with, with the best intentions, but then they start to abuse their power. I, I, I hope that, that you trust Pastor and I to, to be up here and anyone else who shares the pulpit to, to lead you spiritually and to deliver God's word to you. And that's why we must be so careful with what we say. Because the influence that we have, what we don't want to do is lead you away from what God has called you to do and what God has called us to do. So we cannot lead with an entitled spirit. And the enemy tempted Nehemiah in that way to lead with that entitled spirit. Let's take a look. Let's take a look at that real quick. So in verse 10, it says, Now... When I went into the house of Shemaiah, the son of Delilah, the son of Mehedabel, who was confined to his home, he said, Let us meet together in the house of God within the temple. Let us close the doors to the temple, for they are coming to kill you. They are coming to kill you by night. So there's this new guy, Shemaiah. He's just chilling out in his house, and he's like, Hey, listen, I got some, I got some insider information. I got some tea, bro. They're coming to kill you tonight. Why don't we go into the temple, shut the doors, uh, lock it up so, so that they can't. Let's go in there and be safe. But here's the thing. Here's how Nehemiah responds in 11. Here's the response. Should such, as man, should such a man as I run away? And what man such as I should go into the temple and live? I will not go in. What we know about the temple is that there was, there was a part called the, the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. And if anyone went in there outside of the high priest on one day a year, you would be killed. And so Nehemiah, he did have the authority to go into the temple portion of it. But here he says, I, I don't have that. I don't, I, should such a man as I go in there? He, he did have the authority to go in there because God had, had commanded him to rebuild the temple, to rebuild Jerusalem. But he, he, he didn't want to do it for personal gain. Because he knew as soon as he did it for personal gain, the people, uh, he would lose all credibility with them, and his leadership would become like dirt. And so he said no to the temptation to lead with an entitled spirit. He says, I'm not going to hide out. I'm not going to stop the work that I'm doing by building this wall, by repairing the gates. I'm not, I'm not going to come down from, from where I'm at. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to stop because God has given me a good work to do, and I will finish it. Any diversion, any distraction, any temptation to do anything else, no, I will not do it. I say no to everything else, because my purpose is to say yes to God's calling for my life. We need to watch for that. We need to watch for the pride. We need to watch for the entitled spirit. We need to watch for those things in our lives and in our ministry lest we fall into temptation. Whenever, whatever you do in life, whatever God is calling you to do, when it starts to happen, when it starts to flourish, right? We, we talked about that. When it starts to grow, the distractions are going to show up. Why? Because as soon as the work goes down, the opposition shows up, right? And, and, and when Nehemiah noticed that, he didn't stop. He, he said, no, he continued to see the faithfulness of God. He realized that this isn't just a good work, right? Yeah, a couple weeks ago, we talked about that he said it was a good work. I am doing a good work, but, but really, it wasn't, it wasn't just a good work. It was a great work. It was a great work that the Lord had commanded him to do. Put, he, he put Nehemiah in the exact right place at the exact right time with the exact right king so that he could go to him and, and ask him to build this back up to do something that will outlast him, a great work. And Nehemiah sends the message to haters, to the doubters, to the critics, and he says, I'm doing a great work. I can't come down. I'm doing uh, a great work. I cannot be bothered by your opinion. I will not come down from this ladder because I am doing a great work. No, I will not fall back into my lustful temptations. Why? Because I am doing a great work. No, I will not pick up that bottle again. Why? Because I am doing a great work. I will not fall back into my old ways because I am doing a a what? A great work. Nehemiah wasn't just doing a good work. He was doing a great work. 
And I don't know who this is speaking to today, honestly. I, I, I really don't. But, but I'm, I'm envisioning here maybe, maybe a mom who has some small kids running around like drunk squirrels and diapers, getting stuff on everything. And you're so tired and you're so worn out of all the, all the crap that's been going on, just everything pouring on. And you're just like, man, I just want to give up. Let me tell you something. Don't. Because you're doing a great work. Maybe you're trying to pay off debt. Student loans, anybody? Yep, me too. Uh, and you're, you're trying so hard and you're trying to make every penny work. Every penny work, and you're just so sick and tired of, of having to pay this stuff off, and, and you're like, man, I just want to buy something for myself. The, the PS5, it, it might be coming, uh, and, and I might be able to get it at a retail price, like I want to get it, but like, listen, don't fall into that trap, because you're doing a great work. Maybe, maybe you're trying to love somebody that's hard to love. Maybe you've been trying to reach them for so long. Maybe, maybe you've been uh, trying to show them the love of Jesus, and, and they just will not uh, respond. They, they won't give in. But, but let me tell you something. That love that you show them now may affect their eternity. That love that you show them now might lead to their eternal salvation and, and to uh, their great work. They might step into their new calling and plant a church that, that, that reaches millions of people. That is a great work. And, and listen, when, when things get tough, when, when you start following Jesus, he said, things are going to get hard. The world is going to hate you. John 15, 18, if the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. And because it hated me, a, and a servant is no greater than its master, it will hate you. For if it loved you, you would be of it. But I have called you out of that. And as soon as you begin that good work, things are going to get tough. But if people hate you because you love Jesus, that's fine. But if people hate Jesus because of you, that's not okay. So continue doing the great work. Continue sharing Jesus with all that you meet. Continue doing these things because you are doing a great work. And this is a crazy, miraculous story. It's crazy because Nehemiah was an ordinary guy. He wasn't a priest, he wasn't a prophet, he wasn't a king, he wasn't an architect, an engineer. It, there, was, there was none of that. He was just an ordinary dude who asked God for some help to go and do this good work. He stepped into his calling. In verse 14, Nehemiah says, Remember Tobiah and Sanballat, oh my God, and according to these things that they did, and also the prophetess Nodiah and the rest of the prophets who wanted to make me afraid. So the wall was finished. Get this. The wall was finished on the 25th day of the month of Eul in 52 days. We want to build a church. That might take a couple years. We could probably do it in 52 days. Come on, amen? We could do it in 52 days. There was no supernatural effort to this. There was nothing. There was no talking donkey. There was no fire from heaven. There was no parting the Red Sea. There was no uh, ten-foot angels with flaming katanas singing, we are the champions in the background. There was none of that. There was simply a call from God, a response, and a step into that calling. That's all it was. It was him sitting down to cry, kneeling down to pray, standing up to act, inspiring people passionately, pursuing God faithfully. Throughout this whole thing, he pursued God faithfully. He never looked back and he kept his eyes on the prize. And whenever the enemies would try to distract him, he would say no. I'm saying no to that distraction. And in verse 16, here's the good part. Yeah, this is the good part. All that else is just nothing compared to this. And when all our enemies heard it, all the nations around us were afraid and fell greatly in their own esteem. They perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. They perceived that the wall that was built, the, the city that was restored, was done with the help of our God. God. They realized this work had been done with the help of our God. Who was it that was glorified in this situation? Was it Nehemiah? No. 
It was God. Who was the one that called Nehemiah to this? It was God. Who was the one that gave Nehemiah the energy and the strength to do this? It was God. And the end result was God's glorification and the restoration of a nation. That one day, that same temple that was built by Nehemiah, Jesus would walk into and overturn the tables. That same, the same walls that Nehemiah built, Jesus would walk through that gate on the Sunday before he would die, knowing exactly what would happen. This wasn't just a good work. This was a great work. So my question for you is what is God calling you to do today? What has God been calling you to do the past three weeks? What work have you been neglecting? How are you going to step into that? The first week, we asked you to think about what, what breaks your heart? What makes you want to sit down and cry, kneel down to pray, and stand up to act? We asked you to, to think about that. And, and maybe you don't know yet. Maybe you're still in, in that sitting down to cry or maybe that kneeling down to pray season. But, but if you know for certain what God is calling you to do today, step into that. If God is calling you to surrender your life to him, step into that. If God is calling you to join the tech team, listen, I, I want to be really honest. We have, we have four people up there. We have four people on our team. And, and we, we work about three, three Sundays, two to three Sundays each, each month. And it's, and it's tough stuff. You've you got to stay focused. You can't uh, drone out. You can't get distracted. We need people to help up there. What is God calling you to do? Maybe it's, maybe it's kids men. Maybe it's youth group. I'm, I, we're, we're trying, we're trying to, to grow the youth group, and we need leaders to, to help out with that. Whatever it is, step into that calling. Because here, here's the thought that I want to leave you with. Are you ready? You will never finish what you don't start. You will never accomplish the work God has called you to do if you do not simply step into that calling. So step into that today. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, the same walls that were built by Nehemiah's hands, Lord, you walked through to give up your life for my sin. God, that I would be forgiven, that I could repent and turn away from those things that were dragging me down, God. You demonstrated your love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, God, and we praise you for that today. We praise you, God, for, for all that you do, Lord, for helping me step into my calling, for directing pastor to step into his calling for Royce and, and for Emily and for Lex and for Bree, for all stepping into their callings. Lord, I pray that if there is anyone here today that wants to step in uh, to, to their calling, maybe it's just surrendering their life to you. Lord, that they would and that they would make themselves known. Father, that they would pray to you that, that they're so dreadfully sinful. God, and that you would just forgive them and be the Lord of their life. Father, I pray that this message is, is stirring the hearts of individuals here to step into what you have predestined for them to do. Lord, I pray that through this message, through this ministry, God, we would equip the saints to be sent out across the nation, across the street, and around the world, and that people would be saved. Lord, that we would see 30,000 come to faith in a single day like the disciples did. Father, I pray that when you return, that every person in Yankton and in South Dakota and the United States and in, the, in, in, in the, uh, the continent, Lord, would be raptured with you and live forever with you in heaven, ruling over the new heavens and the new earth, God. Lord, I pray that those who are lost would be found. God, that those who are struggling uh, would know that their struggle is for a purpose. Praise you, Father. I thank you and I love you, and it's in the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen.